Hello and good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining this week's episode of Atram's webinar series. I'm Bernice, Equities Analyst at Atram, and your host for today. So this morning, we will be having a very interesting introduction on investing in the local equities market and the Atram Philippine Equity Opportunity Fund. Before anything else, I'd like to let you know that this session will be recorded and that copies will be disseminated within the day as well as posted on all our social media platforms. Also, please don't forget to visit our website, that's www.atrem.com.ph, for more detailed information about all the funds that we offer. If you have any friends who you think would like to listen in on this webinar, but are unable to attend, please feel free to share the YouTube replay of this session, which will be posted on our channel, Atrem Studios. We would also like to invite everyone to join Atram's new official Viber community group, hashtag AtramPHCommunity, to stay updated on the latest announcements, advisories, and reminders. For your convenience, you could scan the QR code shown here or visit this link and get a chance to win Atram merchandise. We would also like this webinar to be as interactive as possible, so please don't hesitate to send your questions in the Q&A tab all throughout the webinar as we have a super special surprise for you for you all. Each question you send is a raffle entry for a chance to win Atra merchandise. Winners will be announced at the end of the webinar, so please make sure you stay until the end. We will also be sending a quick feedback survey after the webinar, so we do hope you can share your thoughts with us about our session today and on how we can further improve our webinar series. Now let's move on to the long-awaited event. Due to some unforeseen circumstances, Nikonor Yumul will, will not be able to join us for today's webinar. But don't worry, as we have another very special guest, El Jamil, Atram's one and only head of research to discuss investing in the local equities market. So now, sit back, relax, and let me hand the floor over to El. Hi, good morning. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Bernie, Bernice, for that really kind introduction. And um, as you've seen probably in, uh, in uh, the title of this webinar, um, the, our focus really is to look at the, the recovery scenario of the Philippines and identifying who will be the, the beneficiaries of a reopening. And um, throughout this, this webinar, we will be looking at the key uh, indicators that we are looking at to identify these winners. Uh, but I think that it's very important that we look at what we've seen so far, what we're currently seeing, and what we expect to see in terms of these indicators. So first, historically, foreign flows uh, have always been a strong driver for market performance. What we have seen in the fourth quarter of last year, however, we saw a diverging trend, wherein the market was supported by local buying as foreigners continued to sell. Now moving on, um, after seeing an outflow of 2.5 billion US dollars in 2020, the foreign outflow has not really abated. So far in 2021, we've seen continued outflow of 500 million US dollars, or 20% of what we've seen in 2020. Now, this begs the question, why? The next slide will show you uh, the reasons why we think why. The PH or the Philippines still lags relative to its regional peers. Um, next slide, please. So the, the Philippines still lags relative to its regional peers in terms of the key recovery indicators that we identified. First is the mobility in public areas and transport. Second are the earnings recovery and GDP earnings, uh, GDP recovery. And then lastly, inflation. Now, as you can see from, from this graph, transport mobility is still down by close to 50%, while retail and recreational traffic is still down by at least 30%. In terms of earnings um, for other countries, this year is already past 2019 levels for the other countries. But the Philippines will not achieve that until 2022 at the earliest. GD GDP estimates tell more or less the same story. Now you add to this the uncertainty uh, on inflation that we are facing that may impact monetary policy and its potential impact on domestic demand recovery. But all of these metrics that we looked at are either current or historical. But what is really relevant for us investors, we're always forward looking. And uh, what, do, what do we think these metrics will look like in maybe six months or a year or so? 
the sequential the sequential improvement that we've seen from corporates from what corporates are reporting and what we're also seeing on the ground is why we think the foreign selling is a buying opportunity for you to build your position in equities. So next slide, please. First, we take a look at inflation, for instance. Uh, despite the spikes that we've seen in the past two months, the expectation is that inflation should start to normalize again by the second half. Admittedly, the Philippines has been very susceptible to supply shocks relative to its peers. We can attribute this to the low productivity of our agricultural sector due to the low mechanization, which leads to inefficiencies. However, the government has since implemented programs and controls and measures to cushion the blow of near-term shocks. We've seen the rice tarification law, the improvement of farm-to-market infrastructure, and price controls and increased trans importation as needed. But don't be mistaken, we still have a long way to go with, in terms of improving productivity, but things are definitely improving. The next key recovery metric, as seen in the next slide, will be on mobility easing. Now we've seen other prov provinces shift already to NGCQ, but NCR is still largely under GCQ. However, the, despite the differences in tags, we've already seen restrictions easing in NCR, as we can see in the next table. We've already come from a, from a long way from the EC, very restrictive ECQ restrictions last year. Recently, the interprovincial requirements and documentations and swab tests have been eased. This should improve labor entry into NCR uh, from workers that went home to their provinces during the pandemic. Also, um, the, re the relaxation of age restrictions in malls beyond 15 to 65 years old should boost traffic in malls and other recreational areas. Mall operators have noted that the Filipino culture is very family oriented. So when they go out to the malls, they go out as a group. But if their kids, their babies, or lolos and lolas can't really go out, they tend to postpone their trip since, uh, again, they wanted to go out, go out as a group. We think this is a key um, indicator to, to recovery since um, the, the traffic that we've seen in malls so far are still more towards consumer staple spending rather than consumer discretionary. So why does all of this matter? In the next slide, we'll see why we're all we're looking at these indicators. It matters to how corporate earnings can, can recover and how fast it can go back to 2019 levels or even beyond that. We've met with corporates the past few weeks and the indications have been very encouraging. Mall traffic uh, are back to 45 to 55% of peak COVID levels, peaking at 60% during the weekends. Electricity demand slowly is creeping back to pre-COVID levels, while vehicular traffic in tall roads are already at pre-COVID levels. In terms of CapEx, corporates are now also spending again, although they're not yet definitely back to 2019 levels, but this is a good sign that corporates are now getting more cautious, cautiously optimistic in terms of their recovery. Now from a 40% decline in earnings, and that, that is our expectation in 2020, we expect earnings to rebound by 45% this year, driven by recovery in property companies and conglomerates. And these conglomerates are typically own the property companies also. So the recovery in Congos is explained by the recovery in property. However, uh, we're still seeing corporates re report their full, full year 2020 earnings. And um, we, will revise, we will revise this forecast as needed, as we see, uh, as we hear more guidance from these corporates. I think we are also forgetting that we are entering a pre-election year. We took a look at the past four election periods and how the market has performed a year prior and a, and a year after the election, the election period. And we saw the market gain an average of 33% in those four years, driven by conglomerates. So this drives further our recovery stance for this year and the next. Next slide, please. Now, our year-end expectation of 8,300 for PSA is anchored mainly on GDP on corporate earnings recovery. 
which we expect will be back ended this year and may even spill over to 2022. This earnings recovery will attract a return of foreign buying and may even be further boosted by election spending. Now to you, how can you take advantage of this? The strategy is to invest in companies that are reopening beneficiaries, but at the same time, because of the foreign selling that we mentioned before, they're currently available at very attractive valuations. But also, we are, we are also cognizant of the near-term risks and uncertainty that we're facing. So we want these companies to also have strong balance sheets, whether whatever uncertainty, uncertainties that may unfold in the next months or so. So on the left shows, shows our positioning for the Equity Opportunity Fund. Our bet is on names like AC, which, which largely have a broad-based earnings recovery driven by Ali, its property arm, and AC Energy, its energy arm. Also, it owns BPI, which is also the se our, our second largest hold uh, tilt there, uh, which we deem is the most resilient bank in terms of NPL and loan mix. And we think BPI will also enjoy big bank benefit as one of the top three banks once credit growth returns along with economic recovery. Next biggest uh, name there is Jollibee. Despite being one of the worst hit names at the peak of COVID, Jollibee already posted a year on year growth, earnings growth in fourth quarter, fourth quarter 2020, and already started to show a capability of turning around its, its recent international business acquisitions. Next is Ayala Land, which has the strongest brand equity in the residential, in the residential market with a robust pipeline and a strong balance sheet trading at valuations that provide cheap access to its sizable land bank. And lastly is ICT, which is our preferred bet on global, global recovery and growth. ICT also showed resilience in, in, in 2020 and even posted a core net income growth in 2020. Aside from those big, big index names, a portion of the fund is also allocated to non-index names, albeit at a managed level of just 5% of the portfolio. For non-index names, we like Mega White and EEI, whose construction arms will benefit from the kickoff of infrastructure projects, while Mega White is also an exposure to the gradual recovery of aviation. We also like Wilcon and Converge, Converge mainly because of the increased demand in fixed broadband and connectivity that we've seen and we expect will persist even in a post-COVID environment. So now, lastly, let me just end with a reminder that equities is a long-term asset class. What is the bigger picture for those who have the discipline to continue to build their equity positions despite the volatility that we're seeing right now? Now let's zoom out. Historically, long-term investors have benefited from the re-rating of the market amidst different phases of corporate earnings growth, from a rapid growth post-GFC to a more tepid growth in the past five years. Now we think this is where the opportunity lies. We may still see volatility in the near term, depending on how the quarantine restrictions pan out, how the vaccine, vaccine inoculation pan out in the next few months. But we think that the recovery and breakout is just a matter of time. Returning to double digit corporate earnings is not very far fetched, especially uh, the, government, the, the structural reforms that the government have implemented. So we've seen a reduction in corporate in income tax, an improvement in infrastructure, and liberalization of certain industries like retail and telco. These are all very supportive of a growth environment that corporates can thrive in. So all in all, our key message is to continue to, to opportunistically build your investments in Philippine equities despite the volatility and keep your eyes on the prize. So now we can all open the floor for questions. Oh, sorry. So lastly, um, uh, Atram's Equity Opportunity Fund has the longest track record as a public equity mutual fund. So as you may recall earlier, we're very long-term oriented and the market has historically um, created large value for long-term shareholders. So if you wanna invest in a fund with the longest track record, equity, equity opportunity is the way to go. 
Thank you very much for that, El. Once again, to our audience, if you would like to ask questions and get a chance to win amazing prizes for it, please send them in using the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. It seems we already have quite a few questions from our viewers, so we'll begin with those. First question, and this is also very interesting to me because I have quite a few friends who'd like to know as well. What tips do you have for first-time investors entering the market now? Okay, so yeah. Um, given the volatility that we're seeing right now, but also the opportunity that we see, they need to be cognizant of the risks, first cognizant of the risks that they're taking on when, uh, when they enter now. And then also manage or really state out their investment objective and their horizon. Like, are, are they short term? Because in the short term, they may, they may only see the risks, but in the long term, it's good to see what, what the market, how the market has performed in the longer term. And then define what their investment objective and investment horizon is. And then just pick the companies that, we, that, that you think are resilient or may emerge stronger post the crisis. Got it. I'll be sure to pass on that info. So our next question from the audience, and I believe this is also extremely relevant and timely given recent news. What is your outlook on the COVID situation of the Philippines? Okay, so the COVID, making an outlook on the COVID situation is short of um, looking at a crystal ball, right? Um, but for us, we think that there will always be sequential improvement. We think that um, we have already bottomed out in terms of corporate earnings. We've already bottomed out in terms of capacity. For example, as we've seen in the second quarter of 2020. Um, so we think that there will always be sequential month on month or quarter on quarter improvement. Now it's just a matter of how fast those improvements or how, how um, significant those improvements are. Got it. Next question from a curious audience member. What are the top industry trends abroad that could eventually happen in the Philippines? I think the, the first and most obvious one would be in terms of connectivity. Now, prior to COVID, um, the Philippines already lagged in terms of um, internet connectivity and internet speed. And I think we've seen um, the two incumbents and even the new entrants and niche players like Converge try to catch up given the demand that they suddenly saw. And so far from our conversations with, with them, we've seen sustained demand in terms of fiber, uh, fiber broadband connectivity, even with data connectivity with increased data usage. So I think the Philippines, although we were, we were just catching up with how much the region has been performing in terms of, in terms of internet connectivity. The second, I think, will is um, we call this uh, e-commerce. Although it won't be in a much larger effect as we've seen in the U.S., where it really displaced malls. From our channel checks and from conversations, even with the non-public non-public retailers, they see um, brick and mortar stores and online stores work together to create an amplified sales. So from, so for example, um, a certain retailer would only see twice as much sales with just um, online retail alone and just a pre-COVID sales with just brick and mortar alone. But bringing the, the, these two together, which they, which they coined as omni-channel sales, you can see sales as much as eight, as much as eight times as before. I think, yes, um, e-commerce will be here, but to, to supplement what the brick and mortar uh, retailers are already selling. Very comprehensive answer. Thank you, El. Next question, and I believe this was already touched up upon in your presentation. What sectors do you believe will be the winners going out of the pandemic? Which sectors? Okay, so first, I think property. Um, especially the residential developers. Uh, they came from a very low base where there was no construction activity on their sites and real estate transactions were limited. So from that alone, um, you can expect 
um, uh, you can expect a sizable growth year in year. Uh, malls also, but it would depend on how fast foot traffic can go back to pre-COVID levels, or even how malls will eventually evolve in a post-COVID environment. And then lastly, consume, uh, discretionary spending. So the discretion, consumer discretionaries, QSRs. Um, we saw how uh, dine-in dine -in capacity still capped at 50%. And um, prior to COVID, dine-in revenues were 70% of, of QS, of full year revenues. So we think that that, that, will, be, um, that will be the switch that will drive um, discretionary names uh, this year. Got it. Thank you. Next, what factor do you think would drive foreign investors to go back to the Philippine market? To go back to the Philippine market. Okay, I think um, first will be, as we discussed earlier, uh, first the mobility and, consumer, and the consumer con confidence that it will spur, which will then drive the earnings recovery. And once foreigners see that they we think that it will it will spur um foreign buying again into the philippine market got it and then next up what do you think is the impact of the passage of the u.s stimulus bill on our local markets as far as the influx of foreign investors is concerned would it be positive or negative I think it should be positive. If U.S. stimulus bill impacts markets in a significant way, this should bode well for uh, sentiment. But foreign inventors will return in a much more meaningful and bigger way if uh, the factors that I mentioned earlier will improve. Got it. And given the uncertainty of the market, which is attributable to the COVID-19 pandemic, would it be wise to invest now considering that cash inflows are not stable? Yeah, so um, as I mentioned earlier, the strategy now um, is to, to look at the companies that have the most resilient balance sheet. So even if they're, they're um, seeing softer, uh, softer ca ca uh, cash flow versus pre-COVID, they would still have the capacity to take in probably more debt to sustain their operations. So you just need to be opportunistic and very and scrutinize really the, the quality companies. Got it. And this one, this next question is sector specific. So for the property sector, what would you recommend to invest in the existing property companies or the upcoming REITs? Okay, so um, looking specifically at those two types of um, ways of in investing in the property sector. Those are very different. When you look at REITs, you're mostly after the dividends that, it, that they churn out. For property companies, you're looking at, you're looking at growth since they own the, uh, they, they develop the assets, they, say, they sell the assets. Meanwhile, REITs can only, um, can only enhance the cash flows that, that, their current, that the current assets that they own can churn out and future assets that will be injected in. So if you're after dividends, more stable uh, source of income, you can, you can look at REITs. But if you're looking for like um, deep discounts to the prices of these property companies, then you look at the property company itself. Next, based on the PSE chart, there is a downtrend. If it goes to the 5,000 plus level, is it the best time or should we wait more to for it to toe down. Okay, so what was the environment that um, we were in when the PSA was at five thousand, right? Um, I think that was in the midst of uh, ECQ. Now we are definitely we're definitely not there. Um, so, do we think that we're going back to that kind of res restriction? Um, probably not. So, barring any macro fallout. 5,000 is a great bargain in the PSA already. So, but that, that um, uh, a fallout, uh, a downtrend like that requires like a massive macro fallout, like a failure of macro conditions. Got it. Thank you, El. Next question, which will recover first, hospitality or the airline industry? 
Hmm. It, uh, it's hard to say, but um, I think both industries uh, can recover together. Uh, it, but it also depends on the kind of um, uh, airline environment that you're in. So, for example, if you're more, uh, if we look at Singapore, right, um, the flights there are more business, uh, have a huge portion of, of business orientation. Or even just looking at it domestically, uh, we look at Mactan versus Naia. Mactan is really more tourism driven. Well, Naia would have a hefty portion of, of business driven um, business driven flights. So it depends on the the quarantine quarantine restrictions of the LGUs themselves. Now, from what we've seen from uh, the the easing of the requirements now from from moving from one province to another, and some some local uh, for, for some LGUs trying to spur when especially if their areas are more tourism driven, um, they're now spurring. Uh, spurring demand, tourism demand in these areas by again loosening, uh, easing the requirements, and um, really advertising and marketing their places and providing steep discounts. So um, for for airline, so I think between hospitality and the airline industry, they will more or less go hand in hand. Although there's a caveat there on hospitality, since there were a couple of um, property prop, uh, property companies with significant hotel operations that just catered to their internal needs, right? Got it. I'm sure all of us can't wait for the recovery of these industries. Next question. Yeah, definitely, definitely. <laughs> Next question. Not sure if I missed a comment on this, but at this level, would you say that valuations are generally high? So we're currently trading at a little over 14 times uh, forward valuation. Uh, sorry, not 14 times, uh, 17 times. So, um, and but that's versus earn, uh, uh, 2020 earnings since um, it's still rolling out now, right? So it may look um, very expensive. But um, with our thesis of um, looking at the recovery scenario, we're not just, we're not um, confined to the earnings that we see just this year, we, we are looking even at 2022 earnings. So even, so at 2020, 2022 earnings, we're only looking at a little over 14 times. So we think that that is cheap. Again, that is in a long-term horizon perspective. Got it, L. Thank you very much. So once again, to our audience, please feel free to utilize the Q&A box and get a chance to win prizes. Next question, and I believe this is also related to one of the earlier questions. What industry is best to invest in now? So yeah, um, uh, as we mentioned towards the end of our presentation before, it's uh, good to invest in reopening place, right? Um, it's also good to invest in uh, new economies, for example, um, logistics that we've, uh, as we've seen recently. And also in highly rated, um, high, highly ESG rated companies. So those companies that really not only just look at um, their financial statement numbers, but lo looks at the welfare of the environment, of their employees, of their consumers, and also um, keeps, a, keeps a clean house, basically. Absolutely. Extremely important, especially in these times. So next question, yes, definitely. are you worried about the loans that companies are taking are taking in considering that the interest rate is low? Will you be worried if the interest rate will go up? Okay, so um, let's split this question into uh, two parts and how we um, heard banks are taking in loans right now, right? So, um, Banks right now are uh, tightening their credit reviews. So when you take in a loan, they're, um, they're now more um, punitive. So when, when they take in a loan now, it's, it, there's a higher assurance that um, the creditor has better quality than, 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 than usual. Right? And the second is that will I be worried if interest rates will go up? Um, it depends on how fast the interest rate will go up. I think um, from what we've heard from the BSP, they will take a more measured approach in raising interest rates. Um, with how things are now, uh, we don't expect a rapid increase in interest rates. 
for a bank's perspective, uh, interest rates going up is, is a positive, right? But for, for um, their customers, it will, it will largely depend on how fast interest rates will go up. And our stance right now is that, is that um, we will still see a, a low interest rate environment and a more gradual increase in interest rates. Got it. Thank you so much for that, El. Okay, so that's all the time we have now for the Q&A portion of today's webinar. Thank you to our audience for all your questions. And please stay tuned to find out if you're a winner in today's raffle. Before we wrap up, any last words you want to end with, El? Hi, yeah. So um, uh, on the surface uh, level, we may, see a, we may see a lot of volatility in the, in the current market. But we think that this is um, an opportune time for you, whether you're a first-time investor or um, already a seasoned investor, um, to come in and build your, build your equity positions. But really look at the main beneficiaries of a reopening and those companies that have, so, that have shown resilience or is showing resilience in their balance sheets, in, in how they manage their companies and how they take care of their companies. So very, be very um, selective in, in the names that you, that you look at. So yeah, um, that's it. Got it. So thank you again, El. Once again, we appreciate your taking the time to join us today and hope to see you in more webinars. To our audience, please don't leave yet because we have more that we would like to share with you. And also, very importantly, we still have yet to announce the raffle winners. So now, I'm sure you guys are very interested to know more about how to invest in Atrium funds. I would like to call Audika to tell us more. Good morning, everyone. To open an account with Atrium, just visit our website at atrium.com.ph. Here, you can learn more about all the funds we offer, including our Atram Philippine Equity Opportunity Fund. It will then guide you to our online investment platform, Seedbox. But if you have more questions, visit the website's frequently asked questions page, our Atram Academy page as well. It's as simple as that, so I hope you do visit our website at atram.com.ph. Thank you. Thank you, Nika. So to our audience, if you have any further questions or would like to learn more about Atrium's funds and strategies, please get in touch with your relevant Atrium relationship manager or visit our website, www.atrium.com.ph. As promised, here are the winners of our Atrium merchandise. Congratulations, and we hope you enjoy your freebies. We would also, once again, like to invite you all to join Atrium's new official Viber community group, hashtag AtriumPHCommunity, to stay updated on the latest announcements, advisories, and reminders. Scan the QR code or visit this link and get a chance to win more Atrium merchandise. Lastly, please answer the survey at the end of the session as your feedback is always valuable to us. We appreciate your taking the time to join us today. And on behalf of Atrem, I would like to wish for your and your loved ones continued good health and safety. Thank you very much. And we hope to see you again in our next webinars. Have a great day.